pray about it. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for loving us, and we thank you for allowing us to be here, Lord, for the words and the songs that were sung and the truth in them and and reminding us of who you are. And Lord, I just ask that right now the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, Lord, that our ears would be attentive to hear what you would have to say to us, Lord. You have gathered us together, Lord, to hear from you, and I pray that it would be exactly what would happen, Lord. Fill this place. Lord, we love you, and we give you all the praise. That's all in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you've got your Bible, we're going to be in Matthew or Mark chapter 9. Sorry, Mark chapter 9. If we have time, we'll, we'll jump over to Matthew. But uh, we're going to spend the bulk of our time in Mark chapter 9 today and continuing our study of why we do what we do, why we are here uh, as a church, why I, I chose the, the Cowboy Church to continue to take the fight to the lost and dying world and do what it is I, I feel like God has called me to do. And so the last couple of weeks we've talked about what, what makes Cowboy Church different, why I feel like uh, this, is a, this is a safe haven for so many people who have been unchurched or been turned off by church. They come here and they feel welcome. And the first and foremost was that, that, that uh, we, I feel like we have got sanctification and justification right. Uh, For those of you who have never heard that word before in the last three weeks, you've heard it more than you ever wanted to, but it is the truth that that justification must come first. We must be justified. We must know who Jesus is before we can be sanctified. And too many of us expect those who don't know Jesus, who have never been justified, who've never experienced His grace, we expect those people to act sanctified like Jesus would act. And that's not how the gospel works. The gospel is that, that if we draw them in, they hear, they hear the truth of what Christ went through on the cross for the payment and the penalty of our sin, that, that we can then be saved. And once we've experienced that grace, then God can change us from the inside out. We don't have to pretend to be somebody we're not. And so that is what we try to do here. We try to, we try to get those two right. We don't expect everybody to come through the doors to be perfect. That's God's job. It's our job to get you here and to teach you who He wants you to be, to show you His truths. And then last week we talked about the other thing that makes us work so well. Uh, When Jesus went and He called Matthew, right? He called Matthew a tax collector. I hate it among all, right? And He calls Matthew out of that and He says, follow me. And Matthew follows Him. He just gets up and leaves everything behind and follows Jesus with all that He is, right? Right? And he gathers around his closest friends because of what Jesus had done in his life. He had a little get-together, let's say a, a, uh, a, a finger-painting food party or whatever. He gathers them up, and they're, having, they're reclining at the table. They're breaking bread, and they're eating. Uh, he's having a barbecue for Jesus, right? And he invites Jesus in. And as he invites Jesus in, Jesus is hanging out and some really religious people walk by. They see Jesus and they go, whoa. They pull his disciples aside and say, why is your master hanging out with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answers and his response is, right? I did not come to, to, to call the righteous. I called the sinner to repentance. It's not the healthy that needs the doctor. It is the sick. I came for the sick. And we talked about the sick pen. Being stuck in the sick pen, and you know, if you've ever doctored cattle, if you ever had horses, if you've ever been to the cell barn, you don't buy out of the sick pen. You don't go to the sick pen to pick, to pick those things out. You don't go to the sick pen to, to pick your, your next prize winner out. But that's exactly where Jesus runs when he comes into our lives. He wants the sick. He goes to the sick pen. We may not, and the world may not see the value that we have in the sick pen, but Jesus saw it, and he, t- and he gave his life for us, right? And so it is not the healthy that need the doctor, but the sick. And as far as, last time I checked in the mirror, most of y'all that know me know I'm pretty sick. I need some help. And so I'm so glad Jesus came. And that is why I think we work as a church because we all have a role to play and we're all called to reach certain people and and I can't reach the people you can reach. My testimony is different than your testimony, right? You know, I I visited with a guy and I've shared this story before, a a, a musician friend of mine who would come and play a lot at my old church and, and he's like, man, all these musicians, they have better testimonies than me. Man, they were hooked on this and they were hooked on that and they were partying and living this wild life and he goes, I just kind of quit playing country music and started playing Jesus music, and I, 
I feel like my testimony is not as strong. And I said, well, don't go hooked on hookers so you can have a testimony. Right? That we're all called. You don't have to run, just, just start snorting white lines so you can show others what Jesus looks like, right? Our testimony matters, and we're all called to reach a certain group of people. And whatever your story is, we must be willing to share it. But, but we don't have to run out and run into a bunch of sin so that we can claim what Jesus has done in our life. We can be who God's called us to be no matter where we're at, right? Amen. And just like Matthew, when he reached out to the sick, the sickest of all sick, Jesus ran right in there and he, and he said, you know what, this is who I came to save. And that is why I pastor a cowboy church. There's more snuff dipping, beer drinking, all kinds, and I love it. Those are my people. Because I don't dip snuff and I don't drink beer. I don't know how I reach you, heathen. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. But... Really and truly, that is why Jesus came, to save the sick. And so today, we've been, we've been learning and we've been talking about what Jesus has done for us. And Jesus turns the table, tables on his disciples in, Matthew, in Mark right here. In Mark chapter 9, he's been telling his disciples about who he is and who they are in him and all that's going to happen. And he's just, he's just told them that, that he is about to leave. And that they are going to tear down the temple and three days later it will rise again. And, and I don't know that the disciples truly grasp the concept there in the first part of uh, chapter 30 through uh, 32 there. You don't, you don't, I'm not real sure they grasp what was really going to happen. But his disciples knew something big was about to go down. They knew that something big was going to happen, right? And so Jesus has been talking to them about who he is and that this big thing's about to go down. And uh, verse 33 says, They came to Capernaum, uh, Capernaum and uh, when, they, <clears throat> when he was in the house, he began to question them. And so they left one place and they began to travel. After Jesus had told them this big thing was going to happen, they traveled. Has anybody ever traveled with 12 people? It's fun. You stop every 15 minutes to go to the bathroom. We can't all go to the bathroom at the same time, right? And, and, and as you travel, we like to picture Jesus and his disciples in a big circle, walking like this. Everybody's learning from Jesus and following him. But we've all traveled with people enough to know that, you know what, that's not how he traveled. There would be two or three here and two or three here, and they would gather along, and the loners would kind of hang back and just, just be like, man, I just need a break from all these people, right? Does anybody ever get that way when you're, when you're hanging out with that big of people? Anybody ever been on family vacation? It's awesome. Let's all stay in the same house. Let's rent a big house and all stay together. It's going to be so much fun. And next year, everybody stays at different hotels. And you're all like, just come visit. Just come visit. That's, that's what it's like. And, that, and that's exactly what, what that the 12 traveled. They didn't travel in a single fine line going, yes, Jesus. They traveled like we would travel, two or three kind of buddied up here and there. And as they traveled, Jesus heard what they were saying. So when they get into, um, in, they get into town and they, they get into this house, in verse 33, Jesus finishes the verse and he, and he began to question them. And he says, what were you discussing on the way? See, when Jesus gives a question, we should probably answer, right? And when Jesus gives a question, he probably knows the answer, right? And so Jesus, like a parent, driving along, we all have our children, we drive along, we pretend we're singing on the radio, and our kids are going at it in the back seat. I'm like, if I just ignore it, it's going to go away. <laughs> and we drive along, and we pretend like we don't hear it, and we're like, there's sometimes I turn around and I whip my kids and I yell at them, and there's sometimes I'm just like, figure it out, hash it out, right? My, my dad decided that'd be a great idea one time. We had a Suburban. We'd go to all these youth rodeos in, and we're in the back of the Suburban, and we're going at it, and uh, Dad's just like, fine, do it. Just get after it. And so my brother's got me pinned down because he's four years older than me. He's so tough. You know, I was just a weak little boy and uh, <laughs> beating up on me all the time. And so I, didn't, I never asked for it. I was always good. <laughs> I had little brother syndrome in a bad way. I just one time wanted him to hurt like he hurt me. And uh, I never got there. To this day, he still takes me out. And so, and so my brother and I are going at it in the back seat, and, and I mean, he's got me pinned down on the floorboard, and my dad's finally feels bad for me, and he's like, all right, stop, stop, stop. And you know what I do? Pow! <laughs> Bloody my brother's nose. Worst decision I've ever made. <laughs> because I, I paid for it. I paid for it that day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. 
And so as we traveled together, they, they were discussing and they were arguing. So Jesus is leading the crowd, and he hears that they were discussing some stuff, right? He knows what they were discussing. And so he asked the question, what were you discussing on the way? And in verse 34 it says, but they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed which one of them was the greatest. It's never good when kids get quiet. I'm talking from real little to real big. Right? When they shut up, when they're little, it's because they're off pooping somewhere. <laughs> right? They have run around, run around, run around, and they're in a corner going... Right? And when they're real little, that's what happens. And the older they get, like I'm looking and I'm going, I haven't heard anything out of my son in a while. He's doing something he's not supposed to do. Because when he's doing stuff he's supposed to be doing, he's loud as all get out and you hear him. When he's not supposed to be doing, he's like, hey, we've got to be quiet. We don't want him to hear us. Right? If there's kids in here today, don't catch on. We love this game. <laughs> but they got silent. The 12 got silent because they knew they were wrong because on the way, what were they discussing? Who was the greatest? They had the Muhammad Ali moment. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. Something big's about to happen, and they were establishing what we know as a pecking order. Right? It is the pecking order in the house. It is the pecking order of the children. And sometimes I have to let my daughter know, although you're older than my son, you're still not his boss. Yes, you have a higher rank than him, and there are times you get to be in charge, but you're not always in charge. And because you want him to go feed today doesn't mean he has to go feed today. Guess when the last time he rode a horse was? Like eight years ago. He could care less about it. And so because he gets to help you some days doesn't mean you get to boss him around, okay? And so we, have, we establish a pecking order. Anybody ever turned horses out and fed them? There's a pecking order. Cows in the pasture, there's a pecking order. And it's that way all the time. They, they're, they're, they establish dominance. And that's what the disciples were trying to do. They were trying to figure out something big's about to go down. Jesus says he's leaving. The temple's going to be torn down. Who's going to be great? Me. I'm going to be great. I want to be the greatest. And so that is what Jesus is doing here. He asks the question because they, they are... They are arguing over who's going to be the greatest. And I want you to see how Jesus responds. I want you to catch what he's putting down. I want you to smell what he's stepping in, whatever lingo you like to use. Jesus says in verse 35, Sitting down, he called the twelve to him and said, I know what you were arguing about. <clears throat> and he says, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Can you imagine how humbling that was to hear? How humbling that was to have to hear that after arguing who's going to be the greatest, right? Right. Some of you all felt that, like I've thrown a question out and you raise your hand and you're like, oh, man, that was the wrong answer in church. Right? Everybody knows I messed that one up. But, that, but that's, that's what Jesus did. He just took this time to gather them around and he took his disciples and he sat them together and he said, you know what? Here's the deal. If you want to be first in my kingdom, you must be last. Because no matter what world order you've lived in, no matter what time frame you've lived in, there's always been a hierarchy system. We know that there are people higher up on the totem pole. And we go to those people and we think and we hold those people to a higher standard. In the church, we think of Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, Right, T.D. Jakes, Joel Olstein, you got to be one of those guys to be really effective for the kingdom. And what, what Jesus just said here is to be first, you must become last. Right, the, one, of the, one of the things about my job is, is I, I didn't work for my dad for a little bit, so most of the people don't know that I've, I worked for him from the time I was 13 on. And they don't know that I've done every job there is to do at the trailer dealership. I'm not the best mechanic in the world, but I know enough to get by. And so I love walking through the shop and them thinking my... I don't know anything, and I'll be like, have you tried this? And it works. I'm like, oh, man, what a lucky guess. <laughs> or when I stroll through somewhere and I ask somebody to do something, and they say, that's not my job. <laughs> like, that's not good. <laughs> it's not good to tell my father that. And so it, I, like, I, I do my best. I bite my tongue. I'll be like, all right, whatever. And so I've, I've done it all. I've, I've cleaned poop out of trailers where people have pooped in the back end of my trailer. Like human feces. So don't tell me that's not my job. Because I've done the dirtiest of dirtiest jobs, right? And you know, I don't ever get the option to say to my father, 
I don't want to do that. No, no, send somebody else. Right? And so nobody that works for us should get that option, right? And that's what Jesus is saying. We figure there's this hierarchy and this total pole, and we get to these jobs, we're like, yeah, that's below me. I don't do that. And we do that in the church. We'd be like, you know what, that, that helping with kids, that's for those people who are new to the church. I've worked with kids before. Woo! I teach Bible study now. We have an adult, an adult devotional time, and that's where my heart really is. I can't do the dirty work, right? And what Jesus says is this man-made hierarchy that we have is totally flipped upside down, and those who is the best servant, the least of these, will become great. And so he grabs a child and he brings a child before him in verse 36. He says, taking a child, he set him before them and said to them, whoever receives one like this child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. And so Jesus says, when you come to me and you are humble and you you receive one of my children, a child knows nothing other than to be a child, right? And we welcome them in with loving arms, just like God has called us to do. That is what the kingdom of God looks like. When we welcome God's children into this place with welcoming arms, where we love on them. Nobody in their right mind is mean to a child. Nobody is mean and says, go away. Nobody, we we love on children because they're cute, they're innocent, they haven't grown up, right? Right? And some of you have experienced the sin curse fall of the world that we live in and you as a child were abused. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm telling you is, is, is what Jesus says when he establishes pecking order. He says those that can love anybody are the ones that, that are truly doing my work. That is what we are called to do. That is who we are to be. And so he goes from telling them all that he is. He says this is what you do. You love the little children. You love those who are young in their faith, those who don't know me, and you welcome them with open arms. That is what the gospel is. That's what he's told us to do. And so we're going to hustle through the verses 38 through 50 here. He carries on the conversation, and John steps up to defend his disciples and his fellow brothers, and he says, well, you know, we were kind of arguing about that. But here's something good that we did. John 28, he says to, or verse 38, John says to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he was not following us. John says, they weren't part of our club, so we told them not to be doing your work. His disciples had taken ownership because they had given it all up to follow Jesus and go and do And so they were telling others no longer to do what Jesus had instructed us to do. He said, a man was doing a work in your name, and because he was not one of us, we told him not to be doing that. That's my job. That's my glory. That's my credit. And Jesus' response is where we're at today. Too many times we in church get so tied up into what we want to do. Well, that's my part of the church. That's my pew. That's my ministry. That's my thing. And don't you come in here and try to change it. It's funny and true. It's funny and true. You parked in my spot and you sat in my chair and that is not going to happen anymore. I'm going to throw my sucker in the sand. I'm going to drag it around a while. (laughs) And that's what Jesus, that's what John just said we did. Hey, you're not part of our team. You can't do that. You stop. And Jesus' response is what we all need to hear. Jesus says, Do not hinder him, for there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name and be able soon after to speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. For whoever gives a cup of water to drink because of your name has followers of Christ. Truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. It is not our job to be the ministry police. He tells his disciples, here's what you do. You love on them. You become the least of these and you become a servant to all. You love the lost world like little babies. And he said, when you are so concerned with what they're doing and why they're doing it, they're doing it in my name. 
What evil can come of it? Why are you so concerned? You know, I talk a lot about traditional church settings and what that looks like. And I promise you, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a traditional church. I don't think I have the market cornered on how to reach the lost world. There's people coming to Jesus all over the place without their cowboy hat on. I love it and I'm here because this is the group of people God has called me to reach. But we cannot be so single-minded. We do not own the gospel of Jesus that if you don't come here, you're not doing a good work. So many people buy into the program that Cowboy Church is the only way to work. And hey, it's a great way to reach a lot of people, but it ain't the only thing that works. I can promise you that. There's a lot of you sitting in this room that wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a different type of church. But we are reaching a lot of people that were not being reached because of what we're doing and how we're doing it. And so we cannot be like John and say, well, you're not part of our club. You're not doing it right. You're not going to heaven. And you know there are denominations out there, old school, old school Church of Christ, old school Catholics that would tell you you're not Catholic, you're not Church of Christ, you're not going to heaven. I believe and I'm so thankful that the tide has shifted and changed that we are less worried about denomination and more worried about the kingdom. The kingdom of God is what I am concerned with. Where we are headed as a body of believers in God's church, that is what we should be concerned with. That is what Jesus is telling his disciples right here. He's telling us, you take in the lost and dying world, you love on them in a way like they've never been loved on so that they will continue to come back. And you welcome them in with open arms. And you know what? They may not be perfect, but if they're doing stuff in my name, they're not going to cuss me. If they're not against us or for us, we're on the same team. And so instead of fighting each other, and I know I make jokes about being the best Christmas float in the parade, or if you're going to drive bad, wear your Wise County Cowboy Church t-shirt. You know, I'm, I mean that, right? Like, I mean that. But I'm joking. I'm joking. I know that this church isn't for everybody, and it takes all the churches to reach all the people. I wouldn't want all the lost people in Wise County to flood this place one day, right? Then all your chairs would be full, and you'd have nowhere to park, and it'd be just a bad day. <laughs> and I know it takes us all to be kingdom-minded, all to be focused on where God wants us to go. And that is what Jesus tells his disciples don't be so worried. You don't own this ministry at any point. It can go away. You're not the owner of Jesus, Inc. We all take part in it. We're all shareholders. And so he goes on and he finishes in verse 42 through uh, 48. He says, whichever one of these little ones who believe, whichever one of these... Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone hung around his neck and he had cast, been cast into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire. Verse 45 says, If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having two feet and be cast into hell. Verse 47, if your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes and to be cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. I don't know what that means, but it don't sound good. Now, I, don't, I don't know if you can kill a worm or not kill a worm. I've drowned it a few trying to catch some fish, but I'm not sure about killing a worm. But apparently whatever worm this is, it doesn't die. And that is what hell holds for those who cause others to stumble. Those who are so prideful and arrogant in their ministry, they draw others away from God instead of to Him. And that is what Jesus warns against. When you set up this hierarchy and you put yourself on a pedestal and that's not my job, that's somebody else's job, and you begin to turn others away from the gospel, He says it's better to have a millstone hung around your neck and to go somewhere deep sea fishing with it. And shame on us for getting that way. We get prideful and arrogant and we go, you know, I used to do those things, but I'm not going to do those things. That's somebody else's job. And Jesus says there's no place in his kingdom for it. Verse 49 and 50, here it goes. It says, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Anybody ever went somewhere, had dinner, somebody home-cooked a meal, 
and you, without thinking, because of habit, grab the salt and the pepper, and then you get scolded. <laughs> hey, you know what needs it? You ain't even tried it yet. I mean, that's the first three years of my marriage. <laughs> like, salt is delicious. It's bad for me, but it's so good. And I put it on everything. Yes, and you, and you just you reach up and you grab it and you just go to throwing it on your wife, your precious wife's cooking. And you're like, oh, no, baby, it didn't need the salt. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm so dumb. But salt is good, right? Salt adds flavor. If salt does not add flavor, we're not in it for the texture, are we? And that's what Jesus says. We all have salt to give. We all have flavor to give. And if our, we let our flavor run out, if we get so concerned about others' ministries and we get too high on our high horse to do the little of things that God has called us to do, guess what? We've lost our saltiness and how will we ever get it back? Once you lose it, it's gone. Just like salt adds. I mean, and we've all ate some stuff that needed salt, right? Like we're like, salt, ketchup, salt, ketchup. Mmm, <laughs> that's good. And we've all been there. And we've all been in that place. And we've all really needed that salt at that time. And that's what Jesus tells us to be. To be salt to the world. To not lose our saltiness trying to work our way up the corporate ladder so we can be closest to Jesus. When Jesus says the closest place to me is down on the bottom floor doing the dirty work. That's how you become great in my kingdom. That's what you do. And so Jesus has told us to have salt in ourselves to be flavorful, flavorful to the world. And to be at peace with one another. To be less concerned about what? I'm supposed to be doing and more concerned about what the kingdom of God has called us to do. Well, I was really looking forward to that because that's my ministry. I was really wanting to do that because that's what I do. That's not what the kingdom is about. We have to be humble enough to go, you know what? Maybe somebody else is better at this than me. Maybe it's time for me to let somebody else do this. And that is what... God has called us to do. He's not telling you to step back. What He's telling you is, oh, would you be willing if I called you? That's what God wants to know from us. That's what God wants to know. He wants to know, would you be willing to step up when called and to step down when called? Because once we take that leap of faith and we step up, very few of us like to step down. Very few of us like to give up that power. And I've experienced in all facets of Cowboy Church, I've had people who have served great in one area, in charge of one team, and then you give them a title of lay pastor, or they get to become elder, and it runs to their head and their wife's head, and they, whoo, it's crazy. What power will do? And I'm like, whoo, that was a mistake. How do I correct this? And that's what God doesn't want from us. He doesn't want titles to be what drives us. I, I'm, I'm that way about everything I do. I'm hesitant to say Pastor Brandon, but I just kind of say Pastor Brandon. I'm not the Grand Poobah Reverend Apostle Bishop Brandon Henderson IV. At work, my, my job title's not on my, on my email. They just know where I work. I don't, I'm not concerned about people thinking I'm important. And that's what God has called us to be. And I'm not saying I'm good at it. I'm just saying I, I, I try to remind myself every day that I am extremely replaceable in God's kingdom. He doesn't have to have me. I'm so grateful He chooses to use me. And He chooses to use me because it shows that He is real. He chooses me because we all know that me on my own is not going to get us anywhere. And some of you are in that place. Some of you have lost your saltiness. Some of you need to know that Jesus is here and He cares about the sick people. Some of you need to know that, that, that it's okay to feel like you're last on this earth because you will be first in heaven. It takes all people to do all things. I get a lot of credit for what happens in this church, but I can promise you it takes a lot of people to make this happen every week. That if they didn't show up, I promise you, it wouldn't look as good. And so I don't want you to ever think that we have the market cornered, that we're the only place to go, but we need to be welcoming, with open arms, loving like Jesus has called us to love, and willing to do anything. Welcoming, 
willing, and loving. That's what Jesus has called us to be. Let's pray together. God, we love you. We thank you for today. We thank you for who you are. We just ask that today, if there's anybody here who doesn't know you, that they would come to know you. And Father, we just... We ask your forgiveness for where we put ourselves before your kingdom. And we've made our ministry more important than what you've called us to do. Lord, our ministry is never more important than loving others. Than the welcoming those who need to know you most into our family. So Lord, forgive us where we failed you in that and help us to focus on you and be who you've called us to be. Jesus, we just ask that you would use us in such a way that the world would see our salt, that they would taste the flavor of your love, Lord, and that they would, they would want what we have, not because we bicker back and forth, but because we love each other. And the love that we have for each other draws men and women unto you. Lord, help us to be that church. Not concerned with our work, but concerned with your work. Lord, be with those who don't know you and need to know you. Just draw them unto you like only you can. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.